Retro USB AVS is technically not a new system, but it might as well be one. It was the first and only FPGA based NES system for a long time when it was released in 2016, but it's been off the market for the past three years and now it's back. But should you get one? Ask your YouTuber if the Retro USB AVS is right for you. This is a high-end FPGA based NES Famicom clone system made by a company called Retro USB, but they didn't ship any new units for three years until now because of the global ship shortage that COVID exaggerated. I missed the boat on getting an AVS system three years ago before the global computer chip shortage and I was literally following the GPS tracking on the container ship that was carrying the current batch of systems from Shenzhen, China as it's made its journey across the Pacific. They are currently taking pre-orders for the next batch of systems, but I'm glad that I didn't lose faith and cancel my pre-order. The computer chip factories were busy cranking out more profitable chips than making the HDMI encoder for the retro USB AVS. But things are finally right with the world since they're finally able to restart production on this critical retro entertainment infrastructure. This is the first time in three years that new units have finally shipped. Now, the industrial design on this thing is amazing. It feels like Nintendo hardware, but it's not. They did an excellent job of recreating the original NES design language. There's no wireless card, but there are four NES style connector ports and my 8-bit dough wireless controllers work like a champ. On the back, there is a Famicom controller expansion port, a USB port for power, and a single HDMI output port. On the inside of the cartridge bay, you will find a 72-pin NES connector which accepts cartridges horizontally and directly without the whole fake VCR popping action that the NES had. On the inside, there is a Famicom 60-pin cartridge slot. It is physically impossible to have an NES cartridge and a Famicom cartridge inserted at the same time. And the Famicom cartridge look a little awkward with the cartridge door either open at a 90 degree angle or slanted awkwardly on the top of the Famicom cartridge. But it's a minor gripe and I understand why they did it for a technical reason. Now my only real design complaint is that it's a little wonky to use a real Famicom disk system because the RAM adapter either has to have the cord crunched or you have to put something on top of the back of it to weigh it down to keep the connectors flush. Overall, I'm completely digging the design of the unit and I showed it to someone who works at a game store and she legitimately asked me, did Nintendo make that? That's how good it looks. Aesthetically, it's on point. FPGA means that they are not running an emulator program, but instead are recreating actual chips using programmable gate arrays instead of running a program that's pretending that it's NES hardware. It's like the FPGA system is a liquid shapeshifter from the future, but instead of trying to kill Sarah Connor, it's taking the form of an insanely accurate 8-bit NES hardware platform. It has built-in scan lines, a built-in Game Genie database, zero lag via HDMI, expanded audio for Famicom and Famicom Disk System games, and it even has a fix to the sprite limit so it can reduce flicker in some games such as TMNT2 and Salamander. Now, the AVS has full support for the EverDrive's save states and the Famicom Disk System drives. I am talking about some super exciting Doki Doki FPGA on FPGA action. Now, you might be asking yourself, is this overkill? Why do we need this when you can get an NES clone system for roughly the price of pizza delivery? It is true that NES and Famicom clones are easy to recreate poorly, but it's increasingly difficult to do it accurately on a hardware level. But why would you need one of these? Well, 
the Nintendo Famicom still has roots in Videotech from 1983, and it didn't have the most accurate recreation of color. This carried over to the NES, and while the NES did have good composite AV output, it cannot output an RGB signal without significant new hardware being soldered on. So, if you want to play it on a modern TV, you either have to get a scaler, and the good ones can get pretty expensive. There are some decent clone systems, but they are either glorified emulators, or they're not accurate enough to handle the Famicom disk system or expansion audio cartridges. This thing has crisp 720p HDMI output with an unprecedented level of accuracy and compatibility. What's awesome is that the save states on the EverDrive work, and you can reset using a custom button combination on the system. So when you combine the AVS with the EverDrive, you can have every single NES, Famicom Disk System, and Famicom game at your fingertips, and you can swap between them without getting up. The Retro USB AVS and the Analog NT Mini are both comparable FPGA-based NES systems, but you can actually get this one without having to sell your kidney to cover the eBay costs. The Retro USB AVS is $209, and you can actually buy one. Analog had the Analog NT Mini, and it was $450 when it was new, and now it sells between $800 and $1,000 used. And I know it sounds like I have an axe to grind for Analog, but I really don't. By the way, if Analog is listening to this, I will be 100% fair with any review units you happen to send my way. Now I thought I would test some good old Famicom disk system. Super Mario Bros. 2 for Famicom Disk System. The Mysterious Murasame Castle. Gotta flip that floppy disk over. Now, I think it's a crying shame that it's 2023 and the mysterious Murasame Castle isn't more well known in the West. I mean, it is an action game based on the similar game engine as The Legend of Zelda 1, but involves a samurai killing ninjas. And he gets power-ups throwing fireballs and stuff. And you can slice shuriken out of the air with your sword. And it's a ton of Nintendo fun. But... The only official release that this game had in the West was on the 3DS Virtual Console with almost no explanation.
straight out of Kyoto with Nintendo Fun. All right, here is the Retro ABS main menu. So we have Start Cart. I don't have anything selected right now. Video options, input options, game, cheat codes, also known as Game Genie. I'm gonna try some Castlevania One. Doesn't like it when you. Oh, I have it boot up. So in the input options, I'm gonna turn off autoplay. So here are the options. Menu buttons. Menu buttons when you're in a game and you sort of want to do a soft reset and go to the main menu. Uh, it currently has start, select, A and B. That's my one. Uh, apparently you can have a cheats toggle. Toggle them on and off. Um, so I have one set there. So this option is called expansion emulation. So this is if you have a US controller and you want it to interact with the Famicom disk system. So say you want, or the uh, Famicom expansion port. So say you have a US analog controller and you want to play Japanese Arkanoid 2. Well, you can turn this on and then the button input from the player one is going to go to the Famicom expansion port in the back. But if you're not into Japanese versions of Japanese controllers, leave this off. You're probably never going to need it. Turbo, you can actually do um, turbo always on and turbo is always off. Personally, I'd prefer to have this in the actual controller. Autoplay. Autoplay boots up whatever cartridge you have without having it to automatically go. And you can actually test this down here so you can see the... Um, oh, and turn off the 4Score Pro. It has four controllers for the 4Score, so you can either, if there's some games that don't like it, you can turn that off. Um, so. Okay, so we have cheat codes. Now this actually recognized that I put in NES Castlevania, so we got Infinite Live, Infinite Times, Keep Weapons on Death. That's pretty cool. And video options. This is where it gets interesting. So video mode between PAL and NTSC. Say you have a cart that has a PAL version of say Parodius or DuckTales. Well, this is the option for that. Pixel aspect. So I have it set at three from the left, which is pretty a uh, close approximation of a four by three. This outputs 480p, and they should be red to show what they're doing. So the closest to regular aspect ratio is three from the left. Um, the vertical border. So some games, such as Bionic Commando, have vertical garbage that which. So on s some of the games, the um, They'll have a little bit of data on the side, so basically they're using like video RAM for some tricks. And so um, if there's garbage at the top of the screen, you can actually cut it off with a vertical border option. I'm going to leave it on two. Scan lines. This is the big one. So you can either have scan lines off, a little bit of scan lines, and crank them all the way up. Um, this is sort of simulating, I think I would say it looks almost like a PVM effect. Um, there's not like a dot mask blur or anything. The scan lines are pretty utilitarian, um, but I'm glad that they're there. I actually like the effect, so I usually have it on one or two. So just, just barely, but not all the way up there. I'll leave it on one for demonstration sake. Left hand hide. So on Super Mario 3, they have some data that is on the left hand side and you can either show it or hide it. So this is a little thing that makes Super Mario 3 look better. Extra sprites. So the NES had a sprite limit of how many sprites it can have on a line at a time and Ninja Turtles 2, um, Ninja Turtles the arcade game, was one that actually 
would interact with that. Um, so by having extra sprites on, you can actually reduce flicker. So the um, volume, this is expansion volume for the Famicom disk system or uh, games such as Castlevania 3, which use it. So this is, uh, you know, just leaving it on there. Palette, this is the other big thing. So you have the option of the original palette of the system, the FCEUX palette, and smooth, and you can actually make your own custom palette. Um, so the NES did not have very standard ways of rendering graphics, of, of rendering colors. So uh, there really aren't any tech, so the most closest ones are either original or FCEUX, which is a little bit more saturated. If you like having saturated, either leave it on original or FCEUX. And interpolation, this is for some game TVs that have a horizontal shimmer. Um, and you turn it on to get rid of that horizontal shimmer, uh, or if it doesn't bother you, or it's not your TV. My TVs aren't doing it, so I'm just leaving it off. So, and start up. And you get a wonderful, crisp FPGA based simulation. Man, those colors look great. Just a little bit of scan lines. So if you notice, the garbage on the left is not there. And there's no lag. I just suck. I want to show what Akumaja Densetsu Japanese Castlevania 3 looks and sounds like because it is amazing with the Famicom audio expansion. I am super glad that I was able to finally get one of these. I still prefer to use original Nintendo hardware when playing on a CRT TV, but when it comes to playing NES, Famicom, and Famicom Disk System games on a modern flat TV via HDMI, there is just no better console on the market today. I'm going to be using it to make videos for this channel from here on out whenever I need to capture gameplay footage of Nintendo 8-bit games. Now, speaking of those future videos, I need you to make sure you are subscribed and click that bell icon to be notified of new videos when they drop, usually every Saturday for the big ones. It would also really help me out if you would share these videos with your friends who are into retro video games. This is 8 Joystick. Stay awesome. Play retro.